know, where was the SEC? Where were all the guys that are supposed to be watching, you know, what's going on? Hundreds of billions of dollars. You said billions. I said billions, not millions, from the pockets of the poor to people who are far better positioned than their so-called victims. So you're, you're creating a crime scene and you're creating the crime. You can't tell me after you've learned how to digest a financial statement like these guys have that you didn't see something wrong with those books. That's the bull. mirror flies, the razor is sharp. On the company jet to not the tar. Okay, Nefa, should we get started? Yeah, let's do that. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to welcome to Powder Plunder, the Pandemic and Protests. This is one of the um, IPS webinar series um, entitled Progressive Politics in the Time of COVID. In the, in the time of pandemic, sorry, because <laughs> progressive politics in the time of pandemic. And we have um, a, a couple of, or three, I, you know, because I'm going to include my colleague, Justin, um, very great uh, panelists that be, that are going to talk to us today about what's happening. And just let me give some little preliminaries before I introduce my colleague, Basif Sen, uh, that we uh, do have about, as you saw, may have seen in the running slides, that we have about three more of these uh, scheduled, and they run every consecutive Thursday at 11:30. The next one is essential immigrants during the um, during the corona. Um, actually, we changed the name of that. I think it was border. We did. I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, the the name of it is border borders in moments of crisis. And then the following Thursday will be coronavirus authoritarianism in the far right. And then on July 30th, the next third, the last Thursday, the last one scheduled, we have why we need to save the, the postal service. And many people don't know that the postal service is in danger of, of being uh, uh, eliminated <laughs> and maybe privatized. So um, please join us for that. We have the, uh, for all of them, one of our IPS experts will be um, will be a part of it. They may not, they're going to do their, what they can to also bring in other people to help them, other experts and other people that they work in that are not necessarily IPSers, but are doing incredible work on the issues that are the topics that are being covered. Um, and they're going to make it there as much as possible, make the presentations, multimedia presentations. Registration is required for all of them. So please register on the links provided on the page. And when you pass the word and spread the word and help us spread the word, uh, you should, um, let people know to, to register for them. Um, on more information on all the sessions are on the IPS website, ips-dc.org slash events. I'll take the link and I'll put it, um, the link that has just the, our events and put it in the chat so people can have that. Um, and then, um, and that's, I think that's it. So, so I'm going to, without further ado, hand it over to uh, my colleague, Basif Sen, who's the director of a climate policy project at the Institute for Policy Studies. He's the one that put this fantastic, uh, this fantastic webinar together, and he's going to introduce his, um, his other co-panelists, uh, co-presenters. Basif joined the Institute for Policy Studies as the climate justice director in February. Uh, 2017, but he's been in the movement for quite a while, doing some great stuff. We knew each other even before he came to IPS. His work focuses on climate solutions at the national, state, and local level that address racial, economic, gender, and other forms of inequality. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to, to my colleague, Vasa. Um, hi. Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, uh, today's webinar, which as Nefa pointed out, is part of a series of webinars we are doing over the summer. Uh, and um, for any of you who are not familiar with IPS, just a few brief words about IPS. Uh, we are uh, one of the oldest progressive 
multi-issue think tanks in the country dating back to the 1960s. And uh, we were founded specifically to uh, uh, push back against the war in Vietnam, but our founders realized very quickly that you cannot do that without also focusing on racial justice and economic justice and a host of other issues. You cannot treat any one issue in isolation uh, because all of our oppressive systems intersect. And so um, the climate policy program does not work in isolation. Uh, we are very much part of the IPS family of programs that look at a wide range of issues from workers' rights to mass incarceration to foreign policy, et cetera. Uh, and um, the Climate Policy Project also works in very close partnership with a number of other organizations. And I have uh, uh, invited two of my amazing colleagues and comrades to be my co-presenters today. And I will uh, very briefly introduce them both. Uh, Anthony Rogers Wright is uh, the policy lead on the Green New Deal at the Climate Justice Alliance. And he is a longtime activist on environmental and climate justice issues. And he has particularly deep expertise on issues of uh, agriculture and food justice, uh, which is a very valuable and important lens to bring to this work. And Johanna Bozuwa is, I, pardon me just one second while I look up her exact title. Uh, she is co-manager of the Climate and Energy Program at the Democracy Collaborative, where her work focuses on energy democracy, uh, which is the premise that just energy systems must actually be accountable to um, people uh, and not just be concentrated in the hands of corporations. And um, uh, Johanna is also a longtime activist on fossil fuel divestment and other issues. Um, and uh, with that, I think I want to jump in and start our webinar today. And I'm going to look at, oh, this is not, hold on. Let me shut down the windows before I um, share my screen here. Okay, um, uh, hopefully everyone can view my screen. Um, if not, uh, if not, please uh, put a note in the chat. And um, so these are our presenters, as you'll see. And first, we're going to very briefly cover uh, the the roots of the present crisis and and um and the history behind it etc before we dive into what social movements are actually doing to address it and specifically we are going to look at the fossil fuel and other polluting industries and the way they are exploiting uh, the current crisis with the pandemic uh, to further their own end um, and um, then look at what social movements are doing to fight back against that power grab in particular, but against these industries more broadly. So with that, uh, many of you may be aware of the fact that um, uh, 
fossil fuel industries are facing a big economic crisis right now. Oil prices have fallen to historic lows, and at one point in April, even when negative, where oil producers had to actually pay people to take the oil off their hands. And along with the fall in oil prices, the share prices of publicly traded oil companies has also plummeted. Now what's behind this? The oil and gas industry would want you to believe that it's because of the pandemic and it's because, you know, as all economic sectors have suffered in the pandemic, so has oil and gas. But that's only a very small part of the story. To a large extent, this crisis has been of the oil and gas industry's own making. Uh, that the very low prices happened in a context of very low prices over a broad historical period uh, that uh, was attributable to overproduction by oil and gas companies and particularly by U.S. oil and gas uh, producers. Uh, and so essentially, the oil and gas industry is asking for a government bailout uh, in the name of the coronavirus for a crisis of their own creation. And now on to Anthony to talk about another facet of the crisis that oil and gas companies are facing. Thank you um, so much, uh, Brother Basav. Um, <clears throat> well, as we are seeing from um, this slide, um, you know, this moment is uh, apparently turning into momentum. Um, I'm sure I don't need to um, share with um, the people who are attending on this webinar, the incredible news that uh, we received uh, last week within three days of each other, um, the outright cancellation of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, um, which was uh, um, just receiving all kinds of scrutiny um, and pushback uh, due uh, mainly to the incredible uh, solidarity of um, grassroots activists um, working with um, indigenous folk, black folk, environmental justice groups, etc. So uh, this was a very big victory for us. Um, for all of us, and then for many of us who have, were either at Standing Rock ourselves or contributed to it in some capacity, help people get there, um, following um, um, the, the um, indigenous-led struggle by the Lakota uh, Sioux tribe, um, just to get this news that a federal judge essentially not only uh, shut the pipeline down, um, but also uh, directed that the oil in the pipeline be drained. And um, this, this was uh, huge, you know, uh, for, for all of us. And, and we, were, we were just so ecstatic. And then of course, we know that we are getting more and more pressure um, to eventually hopefully shut down the Keystone XL pipeline once and for all. A judge out of Montana also ruled that um, uh, just like the other two pipelines, their analyses uh, pursuant to the National Environmental Policy Act were not adequate enough. So, um, you know, not only is this a, a, a big blow to these pipelines, but it's also sending a, a larger message that um, the, the era of um, fossil fuel infrastructure, that fossil fuel extraction is, is, is coming quickly to an end. And, um, it's, and it's not just the, the moral implications um, anymore, even though we would like it to, to be rooted in moral implications, but financially, as uh, Brother Basa had uh, broken down in the previous slide, it just doesn't make any financial sense. It's just simply not prudent. As we saw um, only two or three months ago, the price of oil was less than a six pack of beer and a uh, Nathan's hot dog in Coney Island, where I used to uh, spend my time as a child. So um, these, of course, are, uh, and if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, these, of course, are uh, important uh, uh, victories that we will use to uh, fuel us. But we also know that you know, we, we can't uh, give up the struggle. Um, as a matter of fact, um, as we uh, already know with the, um, uh, the, the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, it's already, the ruling has already been appealed. Um, we know that this administration has stacked the courts with um, federal judges, um, as well as the, um, um, the legacy that he has left um, in the Supreme Court with uh, Justices Gorsuch and, and, and Kavanaugh. So we're definitely going to have to um, 
you know, keep up the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the struggle. So, um, and, and also we know that the work is not over because uh, there is a, a response to building out the world. And I think um, I'm ready to pass it to my good sister, Johanna, to talk um, uh, more about that and, and, and give us um, even more reasons of why we have to stay vigilant and, and keep, uh, keep the struggle going. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, to, <laughs> we have had these incredible wins in the past couple of days. I mean, 48 hours and we saw three pipe downs be taken down um, because of indigenous leadership and people who are on the ground. Um, at the same time, we are fighting continually, uh, particularly because the elite response to the current crisis and um, to their fossil fuel friends, um, you know, in their ear, they have been working to bail out the fossil fuel industry. Already, um, an analysis by Documented shows that uh, fossil fuel companies have received $3 billion at the least in U.S. COVID-19 aid. Um, and they're getting this through a range of different strategies. It has been um, a concerted effort to make sure that they apply or uh, to these different uh, lending facilities, both in the Federal Reserve, in the Small Business Administration, and other um, strategies that uh, for investment that are being deployed right now. And um, so, you know, we're seeing the things that are supposed to be used for small business in America being used for these large companies that should not apply, be able to apply for these, um, you know, this support in this moment. And it's propping up a, um, a system that is extracting uh, not only from us, but extra, uh, you know, in terms of Na from nature and from our communities. It's also extracting money that needs to be invested so that we can uh, survive this current economic crisis. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, um, this is exactly what the shock doctrine is that, you know, uh, Naomi Klein talks about a lot. We are seeing, um, as she says, extreme corporate opportunism right now. And that's coming in the uh, form of a bailout, but it's not only just, you know, in money, monetary uh, terms. It's also coming in uh, regulations and deregulation that we've, we see time and time again in these moments of crisis. So for instance, um, Fossil fuel companies have been able to uh, start putting out what, what is called winter fuel, which is dirtier fuel that inc increases smog um, during the summer, which um, this is in the moment in which we have COVID-19 happening that ha has respiratory implications. So we are just making people sicker through these types of um, de deregulation components. And that is like part and parcel to the shock doctrine. Um, and we're also seeing just the lack of democracy that's happening right now due to, you know, the, the the fact that we don't have physical access to spaces in the same way and uh, you know seeing that they're able to push things through um, when they absolutely should not and you know we've seen obviously that we we are having some wins in the courts with these um, with the pipelines and that is extremely encouraging and we're also having to fight uh, so that we have access to our democracy so I think we can go on to the next slide okay so every time you bail out an oil and gas company, you are effectively bailing out a big bank. Because Wall Street has their tentacles in pretty much all areas of our economy. So just very briefly, here are the ways in which big finance is enmeshed with big oil and gas. Large financial firms own stock in fossil fuel companies. They provide loans to fossil fuel companies for specific projects. They underwrite bond issues of fossil fuel companies, which is the publicly traded debt of the companies. And then insurance companies provide insurance coverage. And remember, we're talking about an industry that poses massive health and safety risks. Uh, they literally deal in flammable and explosive substances. They need a massive amount of insurance coverage in order to be able to function. And insurance companies are providing this lifeline to fossil fuel companies. And just to give you an idea of the scale, 35 large banks have provided 2.7 trillion in 
fossil fuel landing in just the last four years since the Paris Agreement went into effect. In other words, since there was broad global knowledge of the need to take action on climate change quickly. Even since then, they pumped all this money in. And here are some of the worst offenders. And uh, look, the, the, you know, four of the biggest US banks are four of the worst offenders. JP Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, Citi, and Bank of America. These are literally the names of the parties responsible for bankrolling the climate crisis. And on to Anthony to talk about another, another exploitative sector. Um, thank you, Basab. Um, I, I think um, the, the, the primary point that I want to make here um, and this is a message to all the attendees and, and the entire climate and environmental communities is that um, you, uh, m much of the time our attention is um, on uh, uh, big oil. And, um, and that's, a, that's a very important focus. Um, less often though, uh, do we put um, big agriculture into the same category and they're just as calamitous um, as, as big oil. Um, we, we, we have um, incredible comrades Food and Water Watch, Friends of the Earth, and certainly many members of the Climate Justice Alliance, including the National Family Farm Coalition, Organizing Boricua, uh, uh, Farm Workers Association of Florida, who, who also you know, uh, put big ag in the same category as big oil. So, um, and, and there's so many reasons why um, these two um, industries or cartels really are, are so equivalent. Um, uh, Standard Oil and, and Cargo, for instance, um, is analogous to um, you know uh, fossil fuel workers um, and and um, underpaid farm workers who are risking their health, um, their lives in many cases just to put food on the table for extractive industries that don't really take care of them and don't really and certainly don't take their care of their communities um, once they're um, all set with their communities. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, we, we can start really getting into um, how big ag operates in a very similar uh, way um, as big oil. So um, in many of you or some of you, um, I hope are familiar with the term vertical integration, which is essentially the combination of one or more companies of two or more stages of production normally um, operated by separate companies. We see this very profoundly with um, corrupt corporations like Amazon, which literally has a department that um, scours the country looking for small mom, so-called mom and pop shops that are doing well so that they can move in and engulf them and take them over. Um, we, this is the same thing that we've been seeing um, uh, after Standard Oil breaks, uh, breaks up, but with big oil, the consolidation of smaller oil and gas companies to create this uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, just huge, um, um, oil and gas company that controls everything, the infrastructure, the, the, the price, et cetera. And um, with, this, with the respect to big ag, as you can see in this graphic here, you know, uh, the top 10 corporations uh, uh, control 15.5% of, of the animal feed market share. With respect to livestock breeding, only four companies worldwide are, are controlling breeding chickens. Here in Nebraska, we're seeing that happen right now with Costco coming in to build the largest chicken boiler operation in North America, engulfing um, small family farms or forcing them to work for them. Um, this is the same with seeds. And then um, and, and with respect to um, fertilizer and pesticides, which of course are just as deleterious to the uh, natural environment uh, with respect to water, land, and air. Um, the, these of course are created um, by fossil fuels. So it's not just the, the, the use of, 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 of harmful pesticides and, and fossil fuel products, but it's also the um, harmful operations. And when all is said and done, um, the big ag and big oil are si uh, similar sinister systems producing sinister results where the, um, the victims are planets, uh, communities, and workers. And if we go on to the uh, next slide, please, um, we, we can tie it to this moment. So a familiar trend and uh, what I, I believe Johanna will get to even more is as we're in this um, age of the bailout with the stimulus packages, um, the same thing that we're seeing that um, happening with oil and gas has been happening um, with um, 
the way that we've been doling out aid uh, to farmers. Of course, we know that the combination of uh, this administration's tariffs, as well as just in general, uh, the way small family farms are, are being treated, this has been, um, this, the, throughout the length of this administration, has been a perilous time for farmers. Here in Nebraska, it's anticipated that this year alone, two in five farms uh, will either go bankrupt or they will be forced to sell to uh, multinational corporations. So the $16 billion in aid that the Trump administration doled out, we know that the top one-tenth of recipients received the majority of all payments. Um, one farm in particular, the, the Line Farm uh, uh, Partnership um, out in Charleston, Missouri, so far themselves has received $2.8 uh, 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 million. And then the top 1% of recipients of trade relief, on average, um, are receiving close to $200,000, where the bottom 80% received less than 5,000. So um, as you see, as we're saving big oil, we're also saving big ag. And um, if we can go to the uh, next slide, um, we're, we're essentially um, these perverse subsidies, these perverse bailouts, we're basically paying to literally kill ourselves, kill our climate, kill our communities, our workers and our climate. As you can see, these large scale, um, um, either capos or large scale um, farm operations are just having um, just, just horrible effects um, inimical to environmental stewardship, to climate stewardship, and to uh, worker protection and, and farmer protection in the form of emissions, in the form of, of water damage, and, and quite frankly, in, in the form of, of, of just uh, destroying our soil. By some estimation, um, uh, by some uh, uh, land scientists, if we continue the uh, big ag model of industrial farming, we may have less than 45 to 50 harvests left. That means only 50 more years of, of producing food. And then we also know like uh, the domino effect of what that can lead to. We've seen it in Syria, we've seen it in, um, in Africa, and um, if we don't get our act together and really uh, treat big ag uh, the same way that we are uh, putting our attention to big oil, we can find ourselves in real trouble. The good news is, is that we're not taking this line down. Um, so I'm going to pass it to the next panelist to talk about what we are doing as a movement, what we are doing as a community to fight back so that we can continue to get more wins like we did uh, last week. Okay, Johanna, you're next. Yeah, so as, as Anthony said, we aren't taking any of this laying down. And um, there has been just a, an incredible and overwhelming amount of work that's been done to like do the watchdog um, like work that is necessary so that we can follow how this is being done and then um, take action. So um, one uh, very clear example of um, you know where we are starting to identify how we can fight back at a federal level was the Rewind Act that was introduced by Senator Merkley and Representative Barragon um, that said absolutely none of the CARES Act should be going to, um, to support fossil fuels. There needs to be a ban on um, you know, drilling in the time of COVID-19 because of all of the public health effects. And this is a, it basically signaling this is a dying industry. It is, a, it is also a exploitative industry and it is, um, you know, it is going to hurt our public health. This is not something we need to be investing in. We need to be investing in work workers and communities, and this is not representative. So um, I think that there's just been, um, you know, a huge amount of vigilance and um, uprising when it has come to like fighting against these types of bailouts that are happening. If we go to the next slide. Um, thank you, Oil Change International, for all of your uh, helpful <laughs> um, pieces of information. But I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, we're seeing these bailouts right now, but like bailouts actually are happening constantly in the United States and internationally for fossil fuel companies. And this is uh, you know, subsidies have continued to be condemned and are becoming much more mainstreamed as something that needs to be eliminated immediately. Because what this is continuing to do is giving, um, you know, uh, the, the social, um, it, it enables the fossil fuel companies to continue to extract on our lands and hurt our fa uh, families and also is funding climate denial, as this said right here, with our, um, our investment as the people. Um, so this is something that has, you know, we are seeing in um, dynamics of, you know, the presidential races that we've seen um, and, you know, and more people coming into Congress that are fighting against these subsidies and it's being really mainstreamed in a way I think that uh, we didn't see a couple of years ago even. Um, and that's to, um, because of the great work of activists that have been uh, fighting against this kind of big piece and like federal funding continually of fossil fuel industries.
Okay, Johanna, you want to talk a little bit about the bank and then I can... Um, do you want to go for the Stop the Money Pipeline first or... Okay, you know, I, can, I can handle this and then pass it on to you for the public finance piece. So, um, one of the ways to fight the fossil fuel industry is to fight the financing, uh, to fight the, um, the banks. And you can do it in two different ways. You can directly confront the financers of fossil fuels. And there is an ongoing campaign called Stop the Money Pipeline, which is confronting the worst actors on Wall Street. Uh, including uh, JP Morgan Chase, who we saw are literally the one biggest fossil fuel lender in the world. Uh, Liberty Mutual, who are, you know, who provide insurance coverage to uh, a lot of big oil and gas. And finally, BlackRock, a money manager who owns a lot of fossil fuel stock, uh, including, for example, they are the one biggest shareholder in Exxon. Uh, so uh, directly confronting these companies through, for example, shareholder action, uh, through direct action targeting their uh, retail banking branches when, where they have them, for instance, JP Morgan Chase or Wells Fargo, uh, et cetera. And also urging institutions to not bank with these companies anymore, uh, urging uh, pension funds to not work with these money managers anymore, etc. And then there's another more systemic level with which to fight Wall Street's connection with uh, oil and gas. And that is to go directly to legislators and regulators and change the rules under which finance operates. Uh, and a colleague of mine, Oscar Reyes, uh, recently wrote uh, a really excellent book on the subject called Change Finance, Not the Climate, which is a free download uh, from the IPS website as well as the Transnational Institute uh, TNI website. And a few examples would be um, changing the risk rules under which money managers operate. So money managers are what are called fiduciaries. They invest money on behalf of clients, right? Now, if you can change the risk rules in a way that acknowledges how risky fossil fuel investments are, that would make it harder for money managers to invest their clients' money in fossil fuel stocks. Uh, similarly, you can change the uh, risk guidelines for bank lending, where um, banks that are considered systemically important for the financial system, namely large banks, uh, would be prohibited from uh, making risky loans. And there again, if uh, the financial rules acknowledge how risky lending for fossil fuels is, that would make it harder for banks to make those loans. Uh, similarly, you can change the rules for insurance companies about how much financial reserves they have to have to cover all their risks. Uh, and there again, given how risky uh, insuring uh, fossil fuel operations is, uh, it would mean that insurers would have to maintain massive reserves if they have to uh, sell insurance policies to fossil fuel companies. And all of these regulatory changes would make it harder for uh, the financial system to enable uh, fossil fuel destruction. And on to Johanna to talk about public finance. 
Yeah, I think the other piece that's here is about, you know, it is, um, as Basav just described, uh, and Oscar Reyes does a, an incredible job, it's about changing the system. Um, it's about thinking about where we're getting our money for our investments. I mean, BlackRock is on Stop the Money Pipeline. They're the ones that are actually in charge of deploying so many of the funds for these bailouts. And that's why we're, we see these flows happen. So what happens when we think about like systemic design and how we re, um, rethink how our money is being distributed and dispersed? So, um, you know, there are things like the Federal Reserve, which is also in charge of so much of the, the work here. It is actually owned by the banks. It's not owned by the people. So how are there ways for us to democratize uh, institutions like the Federal Reserve? How are there ways for us to actually in have public banks that are, in, um, are able to distribute the funds that are necessary and actually get them to people on the ground, get them to workers that need um, that access? So you know, the, this image that we put uh, up is from uh, Transnational Institute, did a really great um, book on this as well, and just showing how we can actually think about a new design for how our finance system works so that it is in service to people instead of these fossil fuel polluters. Okay, Anthony, on to you. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, building off of uh, what Sister Johanna um, just said, um, you, we're, we're really at a moment now where uh, we, we do have to make a choice. Um, um, uh, stopping fossil fuel production and infrastructure. Um, you can see it right now as we're heading into the uh, election cycle, or, or, um, or excuse me, continuing the election cycle, where people really stand. Um, we're either going to choose um, peak neoliberalism, which I, I think we have, we have reached and probably on the other side of that curve, versus emerging regenerative economies, as uh, Johanna just spoke about in the last slide. Um, we're either going to continue on this pathway of incrementalism, or we're going to embrace um, expedited transformation that gets us to um, a regenerative economy. And we're either going to um, have this idea of just a transition, or we're going to embrace the tenets and the principles of just transition that will um, protect workers and their communities from continuous fossil fuel infrastructure and production. Um, I quickly just want to also make a note on nuclear and other false solutions, which I would put into the same category as peak neoliberalism of this idea that we can market our way out of um, the, uh, the situation that we're in right now, which is just un unfortunately extremely myopic. Um, I, I have to uh, quote the good brother, uh, Fred, Chairman Fred Hampton, who said, you cannot solve capitalism with capitalism. It's, it's just not going to happen. And, and as you point out so many times, Vasav, so adroitly, um, we're not going to create a market that, that, that at any time could go bust and therefore have um, just um, incredi incredibly horrible impacts on the entire um, economy and, and people's everyday lives as we are seeing with COVID now plus um, an, an oil and gas industry that is you know, never going to reach 60, 80, $100 a barrel um, ever again for, for a barrel of oil, no matter how much uh, uh, they try to manufacture it. Um, we, we need to have a massive shift right now from this idea of phase out to interdiction. And, and, and that means it's not just federal lands and um, um, it's not just, um, you know, uh, uh, we'll, we'll cut down the leasing in, in the Gulf of Me uh, Mexico, where we have um, the production of some of the most horrendous sacrifice zones, including Cancer Alley um, in the entire country, the United Home Nation losing their land, uh, the Luxi Chetamaka um, Choctaw tribe, the first federally recognized climate migrants due to fossil fuel infrastructure and fossil fuel production. Um, uh, also, what I want to say is, is that it's very important for us to think of CAFOs and big agricultural practices as themselves fossil fuel infrastructure, uh, not just because of the emissions, but because of what's in their systems, what's in their, uh, um, their loops, which includes fossil fuel um, uh, uh, products and whatnot. Um, we are seeing some, some very good things, though. Um, our good friend from uh, Vermont, Senator Bernie Sanders, um, along with uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez, introduced the, um, uh, the ban fracking acts. So um, this is going you know, right to the heart of, of what we need to do, um, just ending um, federal fracking permits you know, right off the bat, and you know, also protecting communities and, and frontline communities in particular. We know that fracking uh, wells and fracking waste are disproportionately situated in their black, brown, and indigenous communities. So um, first we're gonna um, 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 a ban on fracking within 2,500 uh, feet of people's homes, and then eventually, according to the Sanders Ocasio-Cortez uh, 
and I believe within 10 years after that, that's it, no more fracking altogether. This idea that CAFOs themselves are fossil fuel infrastructure, we're very happy to see uh, Senator Warren and Senator Booker team up to uh, release the Farm System Reform Act to phase out Las Garage concentrated animal feeding uh, uh, um, operations or CAFOs. This is particularly important because um, I believe it was two years ago, uh, you know, in one of Paul Ryan's, uh, former Speaker Paul Ryan's last acts of, of infamy, um, um, the, the tax plan that he passed, that, um, that, that huge um, omnibus bill, included a provision by uh, uh, Senator Deb Fisher of Nebraska to uh, remove uh, uh, the requirement for CAFOs to report their air quality emissions. And, and this includes really nasty stuff um, that, that has um, um, uh, adverse impacts on respiratory systems, systems um, on, on young people. So um, this idea of, of removing cables altogether will automatically have um, benefits to our air, our land, and our water, which of course are all very important in this fight uh, uh, for climate change. If we go to the next slide, just um, what I want to say quickly to that, since we're talking about this idea of air quality, because now we do have to tie all of this in to the moment that we find ourselves in, where um, it seems that we are woken up to this idea that um, white supremacy, colonization, and patriarchy, which are the root causes of the climate crisis of COVID, um, are, are alive and well in this country. Uh, we saw it, of course, uh, most recently with um, the murders of Breonna Taylor and, of course, George Floyd, who um, you know, uttered those words that, that have come to haunt us. We heard the same thing with Eric Garner, um, I can't grieve. Um, and, and this idea of racial justice and climate justice, the axiomatic nexus between the two of them, um, are really pronounced in those three words. Um, you go back to uh, uh, the times of lynching with ropes and, and, and white supremacy terrorist mobs, that, that was the last thing in, in, in black people's minds. I, I can't grieve um, to this day. That, that's every day for so many black, brown, and indigenous communities, whether it's the 48217 in Detroit, Cancer Alley, Richmond, California, um, the Bronx um, in, in New York, um, you know, I Can't Breathe also is the everyday experience of living in communities that were rendered sacrifice zones where um, 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 uh, fossil fuel industries like Marathon, Exxon, et cetera, have uh, deliberately put their um, industries uh, that, that is just choked out the air. So this is every, uh, leading to um, higher rates of asthma, higher rates of respiratory disease. Our good friend and sister Jackie Patterson, of course, released an incredible report, cold-blooded, um, to, to really hit this all home. And then um, what it all means is that as Black, Brown, and Indigenous and frontline people, you know, uh, uh, whether in, in poor white folk in Appalachia, we are being choked out by toxic police officers, we are being choked out by toxic policies, and we're being choked out by toxic emissions. So I'll stop there and uh, I'll pass it on to whoever's going to pick that up. Okay, continuing on this theme that um, uh, the way Brother Anthony puts it, that this is not just a moment, this is momentum. Uh, we are living in an incredible political moment of uh, mobilizing for Black lives. And as environmental and climate justice people, we bring a very valuable perspective to this fight, uh, which is the concept of a just transition. A just transition is a process of transforming our current extremely violent, unequal, exploitative economy, uh, which we term an extractive economy to a caring, just, regenerative economy that actually serves the needs of communities instead of solely serving the needs of capital. And um, so the one kind of obvious place where people have looked at the extractive economy is fossil fuels, uh, extracting literally coal and oil and gas and uh, polluting the air, polluting the water, turning entire communities of Black, Brown, and Indigenous and poor people into sacrifice zones. Uh, and that system obviously needs to transform. But the process of transformation itself must be just, because we cannot keep the sacrifice zones as sacrifice zones. Let me illustrate concretely. So suppose there is a, a, 
a community where there's a large coal mine. Uh, chances are that it's a very low income poor community. That's, that's what happens if you look at coal country in Appalachia, for example. Uh, but also the entire economy of the place would revolve around the coal mining. So literally it's the taxes, uh, property taxes and severance taxes and other kinds of taxes paid by the coal mining operation that keeps the public school teachers in their jobs, it keeps the firefighters in their jobs, it keeps the street lights, you know, operational in that community. Uh, not to mention there's the coal miners themselves who take tremendous risks. It's an extremely dangerous job. It leaves people with a debilitating, horrible, incurable illness called black lung. And repeatedly what coal companies have done is just as they abandon the land, they leave these you know, toxic wastelands in need of cleanup and just walk away. They similarly abandon their own workers. Uh, they've been trying repeatedly and succeeding in getting away with not paying benefits to their workers who have been afflicted with black lung disease. Uh, so obviously, as we transition away from this extractive economy, we must not under any circumstances leave behind the communities and the workers who have sacrificed so much to allow this extractive economy to function, right? The same principle actually applies to our policing and law enforcement and prisons and our you know, carceral economy. Uh, right now, there are communities, especially impoverished rural communities, uh, where a lot of the economy revolves around prisons and immigration detention centers, which operate in those communities and uh, literally pay the tax revenues which keep public services going. So as we transition out of this, you know, this extractive carceral system, we must build a regenerative economy for these places uh, to ensure that they are not left behind. Uh, and um, that's a critical perspective that we as climate justice activists can bring to this conversation around uh, uh, you know, shutting down policing as we know it and uh, uh, abolition of the police and prison system. Uh, that we must do so in a way that ensures justice for everyone, including the dependent communities. Uh, who, I should add, have been reduced to this position of dependence. Uh, that this is almost like a form of resource extraction colonialism where, uh, you know, just as the colonial powers reduced their colonies to dependencies, uh, our present uh, extractive capitalist system reduces entire communities to dependency. And then on to Johanna for another vital connection between the current moment of protests and climate justice. Yeah, absolutely. So um, th thank you. And, and this uh, really, as has already been described, there are so many, we are operating, have to operate at the, the nexus of racial justice and climate justice. And um, another very clear example of why as um, climate activists, we need to be mobilizing for abolition of um, police is the fact that our, our allies on the front lines are experiencing police terror um, in many of the same ways. Um, if we look to um, Standing Rock, uh, an indigenous led uh, community that was fighting against um, Dakota Access Pipeline, they were, um, you know, there was extreme militarization in those spaces. And there has been a continued militarization um, of police around protest in order to quell us. And it is in, um, and they are working for the corporations at the end of the day instead, uh, instead of any kind of benefit for the people. 
And so uh, we see through this the, um, the relationship between the corporatization and uh, police militarism as well. And um, we, in places where we see infrastructure being built, we are also seeing um, the criminalization of protest. Um, we've seen uh, bills now uh, against protest in places where uh, we have, uh, where there's critical infrastructure, including Kentucky, West Virginia, and North Dakota. Uh, so, you know, the police abolition has to be part and parcel to the calls for action that we're putting together, uh, putting out together as climate justice advocates. And just to add to that, thank you so much, Johanna. Um, uh, as we are getting more and more of these victories, um, you know, there is going to be pushback, right? Um, it, it reminds me of uh, the, the scene from um, The Two Towers, Lord of the Rings, where Gandalf is uh, saying Sauron's retribution be swift, his, you know, his wrath will be, will be uh, uh, vengeful and whatnot. And, um, and we're already seeing it with local, state, um, and even federal laws. Um, that were designed largely in part to intimidate uh, Black Lives Matter activists and their allies and um, um, uh, water protectors, um, for instance. Um, and, and it's not just uh, the GOP, by the way, and it's important to understand that. In, in 2018, um, uh, the, the Democratic House uh, uh, passed the, um, what was known as the uh, Protect and Serve Act, which was also referred to as a Blue Lives Matter bill. Um, and it included uh, vote yay votes by progressive champions, people who we love. Um, like uh, former Congressman Keith Ellison, um, uh, uh, Representative Raul Grijalva, who just released the Environmental Justice for All Act, um, Beto O'Rourke, um, um, all voted yes for, for, for this bill, which um, essentially uh, would uh, increase prison time for Black Lives Matter um, and uh, um, um, water protectors fighting uh, pipelines. So we, we have to remain vigilant, not just at the infrastructure um, itself, but at the policy infrastructure that is meant to um, um, increase intimidation and therefore try to keep people home instead of in the streets. And we've already seen, by the way, uh, what happens when we have principal struggle in the streets, whether um, it, it's news from Minneapolis about not just state funding, but disbanding the police altogether. Um, even um, neoliberal mayors like uh, 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 Mayor London Greed in um, um, San Francisco announcing all kinds of incredible transformations to the police department there. Uh, 150 to 250 million dollars removed from the uh, police budget of Los Angeles and reinvested into Black and Brown communities. Um, there's going to be pushback for that, so um, we have to re uh, remain vigilant about that and hold our lawmakers at all level of government um, um, accountable. And this is why it's really important that we support the platform of Movement for Black Lives and um, the most recent um, release, uh, Breathe Act, by um, our good congressional allies, uh, Rashida Talib and um, Ayanna Presley. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. But but just to say that um, you, you know the, the more that uh, we get in the streets, the, the more they're going to uh, try to um, keep us out of the streets. And uh, you know we just can't let that happen. And one very quick comment before moving on. Um, just as we're talking about who law enforcement disproportionately targets, let's also talk about who they never target. There was a headline from yesterday, which is kind of unbelievable if you buy the narrative of uh, the United States as a place where the rule of law is respected. Uh, I don't buy that narrative, so it was not surprising to me. Uh, but um, the, the company behind the Dakota Access Pipeline, Energy Transfer, has publicly said that they will not obey the court order. Think about that for a minute. A powerful corporation run by a very politically connected guy, the, the CEO of uh, Energy Transfer, a man named Kelsey Warren, is a big uh, Trump fundraiser. Uh, openly saying that he will defy a court order. And where are the police showing up at his door and, and, um, and arresting him? Uh, so, so very clearly, uh, rule of law is meant to terrorize black and brown folks and poor folks. Rule of law never applies to the power structure. And as someone born outside the United States, I have to, as someone from the global south originally, I have to point out 
that if something like this were to happen in a foreign country, especially a foreign country that the US disapproves of, if the government were to um, you know, uh, uh, openly defy a court order or you know, some powerful individual there were to uh, openly defy a court order, uh, you never hear the end of it from our State Department about how that's a lawless rogue nation, but that somehow that criticism never applies internally to the United States. So with that, I'm going to pass on to more hopeful stuff, which is, oh. Hey, yes. Um, so, and to jump off right where Basov so wonderfully left us, um, you know, it, it's clear that these fossil fuel companies don't give, um, don't care uh, about like what laws and regulations we put in place. We have been able to make um, really good progress, but there is, um, they are willing to shirk those responsibilities. And so the proposal that um, I have been working with, with allies um, like Basov and Anthony is actually um, public ownership to take over these fossil fuel companies because regulation sometimes is not going to be enough. We need to have public control so that we can actually enable that transition. And you know, I think the, the conversation around police abolition and like what we're trying to build and invest in is really important here because there, you, at the same time as we are taking and acquiring these um, bad assets in a lot of ways, we have to make it so that it's transforming and um, it is investing in communities and in workers so that we actually get a transformative just, um, just transition instead of, as Anthony's slide said a little bit uh, later, just a transition, um, which we are setting ourselves up for right now. So if we go to the next slide. Um, yes. Sorry. Yes. No, 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 your problem. No problem. Um, you know, it's really about um, making sure that justice is enabled in um, in a transition. And so um, that is why we have said, you know what, it, for workers and communities actually enabling public uh, ownership at, instead of doing these bailouts, you know, we could, buy, we could have bought these things so long ago with the amount of money we put through to them via subsidies and these bailouts, we should actually have the ownership as, a, as communities that are suffering the consequences of these bad actions and be able to do the managed phase out that we deserve on the timeline that we need. Um, and so, you know, this, this doesn't mean that it can't, has to be a, you know, a top-down approach because that doesn't align um, with what our communities need. This needs to be acquisition, but then um, providing the opportunity and space for um, community control of that, um, that future as well and seeing the planning as something that's building from the local level and going up. So, um, you know, wanted to leave on that um, kind of a, the note of promise of that there are different ways for us to do this and there are new forms of, you know, abolition and uh, investment in that, that new future. Um, so, yes, I'll, uh, I'll hand it back over to uh, Basav and Anthony. I just wanted to add uh, to that incredible point, Johanna that um, you know, when we're talking about community control, we're also talking about decentralization. So that applies to our food systems. Um, we, we know that like, you know, when, the, when the power is put back in the hands of the people, when they are allowed to make the uh, decisions that uh, are best for their communities, um, that is when they're actually empowered. So um, you know, the future of food systems is decentralized, um, smaller, locally grown, um, locally organized, locally controlled food systems. And the same goes um, with our energy systems um, as well. Um, we, we don't need like massive, huge <laughs> grids that we're shipping um, um, oil and gas to and coal to um, when we can create these incredible microgrids um, right in our own communities. And the thing about it is we're seeing examples of um, so-called energy democracy, which I know you're a big proponent of, Johanna, and our good sister, um, um, <laughs> um, Denise, um, who, who is, is just so incredible with this. But in Puerto Rico right now, we're, we're seeing uh, microgrid systems um, in the middle of the mountains, and it's working incredibly. Um, in Brooklyn, New York, where um, my mentor and um, the venerable and le uh, legendary Elizabeth Yampierre of Upper Rose, Brooklyn, um, 
you know, created the first community uh, solar projects for one of the poorest uh, communities in, in, in BK, um, as I like to call it. So they haven't gentrified everything yet in Brooklyn. And um, the areas that, that, that are, that are uh, maintaining their black, brown, um, Asian, um, um, and indigenous roots are, are, are doing the work. So um, this is why um, at CJA, we like to say, it's not just that another world is possible, but another world is actually happening. And on that note, very quickly, I want to observe that let's not get ourselves into thinking that renewable energy in and of itself is a magic solution to climate change. Yes, obviously we need solar energy, we need wind energy, but at the same time, we have to think about who owns that energy and who benefits from it. Uh, do we want to move over from an energy system controlled by giant corporations like Exxon to an energy system controlled by giant corporations like Tesla? And I believe the answer is a resounding no. So with that, I think we can open up for questions and answers, but um, before that, I want to say a huge thank you to uh, Anthony and Johanna for being able to join for this webinar today and uh, your, you know, your participation was so meaningful. Uh, and thank you to everyone who joined us online today. And um, uh, just a little word for everyone is you can enter your questions uh, in the Q&A. Um, there's a uh, Q&A feature and you can enter your questions there. And there's one very specific procedural question that um, I want to answer, which is uh, uh, people have asked for a copy of the presentation and um, absolutely yes. And um, uh, I will work out how to make it available, like downloadable on the IPS website. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, and there's two specific questions from uh, Susan Bonney, uh, both excellent questions. One is, uh, who are some of the specific companies who have um, received um, uh, bailouts as part of this bailout process? And uh, kind of a part two of that question is about the Rewind Act. Uh, what are the legislative prospects? You know, how has, what has its progress through committee looked like? And are there specific legislators people should be contacting to uh, support it? And uh, Johanna, you want to take it first? Yeah, I can take it first and then maybe Anthony, you uh, might have some updates on the Rewind Act. Um, I just wanted to pull out one example. There are so many because as we said, so many fossil fuel companies are getting this money. But Halidor um, Coal it, it is a company that has received um, quite a lot of money. I believe it's 10 million in small business loans uh, through this. And they are not a small business. They actually in the past had Scott Pruitt as a lobbyist. Um, and like that is why we are seeing this funnel of money going towards them. So I think that there are just a myriad examples of this happening and, um, you know, even happening for, for coal and, and um, as one of those. So it's really, uh, there, there are quite a few and there's actually some really good um, uh, people who are charting and figuring out like where the bailouts are going to. And I'll drop those links in the chat where you can look um, right now. And Anthony, you want to talk about the Rewind Act? Yes, of course. Um, this was um, an, an incredible piece of legislation that our good friend from Oregon, Senator Jeff Merkley, um, 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 put out. And um, you know, um, as, as all of you know, uh, the, 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 set, the state of our political climate, of course, um, uh, the Senate is controlled by um, our, our not so good friend, um, uh, no lip Mitch McConnell. Um, we're going to have to push, you know, to, to get that bill actually onto the uh, Senate floor and out of committee. Um, if I'm not mistaken, um, that is um, Environment and Public Works. And, um, you know, the, the, the current chairperson of, um, of, of, of that committee, 
you know, is no friend of, of the land, no friend of, of um, climate justice. So for now, I would say that, um, you know, what people could do is, that, is basically electoralize it, you know, uh, make it an issue that um, we, we're not going to use um, money meant to, uh, uh, to uh, bail out uh, working people um, and, and, and municipalities, um, especially at a time when we are um, seeing feckless ideas of sending our children back to school, um, when that money could be uh, used for care work, which by the way is very low, low emission work and no emission work at all. Um, but we're going to have to fight um, um, to get this out of committee. But um, I will be speaking um, with the staff of uh, Senator Merkley actually tomorrow to get more information on it. And I'll get right to you, Vasa, so that you can send it with the, uh, share it with the IPS community. Great. And one quick comment about a company that has received bailouts before addressing the next question, which is a wonderful one. <laughs> um, uh, one of the companies that received a bailout is Marathon Petroleum. And a few words about this company, just to point out what an atrocious bad actor they are. They operate a tar sands refinery. Tar sands oil from Alberta is literally one of the most polluting, dirty fuels known to humanity. And Marathon operates a tar sands refinery in a black community in Detroit. With, and it's literally one of the most, it's the most polluted zip code in Michigan and one of the most polluted zip codes in the country. And there was a majority white community on the other side of the refinery and the company bought them out. Uh, the company literally paid homeowners to take over their homes and allow them to move. But that was not extended to the majority black community on the other side. And, and if, you know, if you ever wondered what does white supremacy and what does racism have to do with climate and fossil fuels, there you have it. Like a naked example, if ever there was one. And the next question comes from my dear friend and former intern, Leilani Ganser. Hi, Leilani. Um, and um, she's asking about the military response and pointing out how the Pentagon is one of the world's largest polluters and they control the ecological future of many, particularly black and indigenous communities. And if we can, talk about that dynamic and how we can fight it. And um, Johanna, Anthony, which one of you wants to take it first? Go ahead, Johanna. Yeah, I mean, I think that their IPS has been doing a huge amount of work in this space and like um, really seeing that we need to, it's, it's very similar to a lot of the conversations we've been having about the police at the like at the national level. It's about that vision of where we can be investing that money. And, you know, I think that there has been this incredible amount of um, narrative building um, around what police abolition really means and seeing how that can be redistributed and how that can be invested and who, and like create even safer communities than we had in the past. And so applying that in so many ways, and like, I think that this is what um, actually IPS does really, uh, really well. It says like, look at what we could be doing if we didn't actually have to invest, if we weren't, you know, colonizing so much of the, the world in order to, um, you know, gain access to more fossil fuels in order to, you know, um, continue to, to fill, fill all of the uh, you know, car, the auto industry and all these other pieces and um, fight on behalf of corporations. So um, I think that I'm, I'm very excited about what, how we translate what um, BLM has been able to do so powerfully into our other movements and learn from one another and like therefore be able to build stronger um, multi-issue movements at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you. Anna. I, I would just add to that. Um, I, I would say that if there is a, a community that really understands um, um, the, the advent of um, defunding the police, it's the environment and climate community. Um, 
all the incredible reports that um, our friends at World Change International give us um, and the divestment movement, right? It's about divest and reinvest. So just, you know, change fossil fuel infrastructure with police. <laughs> and then you're really, literally talking, it's that easy, see? And you're, and you're, you're, you're basically talking about the same thing. So um, this is why um, it was so great to see um, so many people from the environment and climate community join an incredible discussion that was led by leaders like Colette Pinchot Battle and of course, uh, Tinjiwe McHarris and um, our good brother Maurice Mitchell from Movement for Black Lives talking about this, the axiomatic nexus between uh, um, being good climate stewards and racial justice. Um, as Hop Hopkins said in, in his incredible article of just breaking down that you can't have climate change without sacrifice zones, can't have sacrifice zones without dehumanization, et cetera. Um, th this is all intrinsically linked as um, Johanna just said. Um, this, is, this is literally what um, Dr. Crenshaw going back to the Kahambi River Collective meant when they talked about intersectionality. It's about seeing how these systems of oppression are interlinked, right? So all the, all the folk who are on the front lines who were, were the victims of police brutality, who also happen to be hit first and worst by climate change, who are also being taken out uh, of the most by uh, the, the pandemic, these were from existing intersecting crises. So it's going to take an intersecting uh, response and intersecting um, defiance um, in order for us to, to actually win. They're, they're, I mean, they're all linked. It's just sort of like uh, different names. I call it the matrix effect. They all become, they all look like Mr. Smith, you know what I mean, at the end of the day. And um, we're all gonna have to get our Neo on to, um, um, to uh, take them out collectively. So, um one you know quick thing to add is um uh, so at ips recently we put out this report called no warming no war which details the connection between militarism and climate change um uh, more you know more closely and um also the national priorities project at ips has called for a 50% cut in the um, uh, budget of the Pentagon. And, you know, just to illustrate the slow ways in which these demands get incorporated at the, uh, you know, official level, uh, the, uh, the legislative proposal right now, that's the most far out there, calls for only a 10% cut. And clearly we need to keep pushing more. Uh, but one way to address the polluting impact of the Pentagon is obviously to starve them of money. And another way is the Pentagon manages to exclude itself from a lot of environmental laws that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, private sector companies are held or are supposed to be held to, even they aren't always held to them. But but anyway, the Pentagon has some kind of national security exemption where uh, they claim that because what they're doing is for national security, they can end up, you know, uh, polluting and that that's okay. Uh, and obviously that needs to be changed. Uh, the Pentagon needs to be accountable for current and legacy pollution, for instance, military bases that have been closed down like decades back are still left with the uh, toxic legacy. An example being uh, the island of Vieques off the coast of Puerto Rico, where um, uh, the Navy used to operate an extremely toxic, horrible base, uh, which was closed down after you know decades of activism, but it's still left with its toxic legacy. Um, a really quick boss. I, I did see um, a, a comment about uh, vigilantism by um, one of the um, attendees. And, and I guess what I would say to that is that in my mind, uh, the police uh, can be vigilantes too. It's called qualified immunity, or as I like to call it, qualified impunity. So um, I, I think vigilantism is, is um, a, a contextual aspect. And we have to be uh, uh, kind of careful, you know, with that because even uh, with what uh, uh, Bas the example Basa just um, gave with legacy pollution um, and, and Vieques and and, and Africom um, leaving leg legacy pollution right now in the continent of Africa, um, to me that's vigilantism um, that 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 like we, we just kind of like allow. So it, it to me it's all it's all it's all very very contextual. If a cop can can play judge, jury, and executioner. Um, and, and get away with it, uh, that, that to me is just vigilantism in a uniform.
Yeah, Leilani points out in the chat and the Pacific, uh, where the US has conducted nuclear and France has have conducted nuclear testing that has left, you know, entire populations devastated by cancer. Um, and um, there's another question about how to get these issues in the public schools. Uh, before answering it more hopefully, I sh have to point out that uh, the oil and gas industry and other polluting interests have a leg up on us. Uh, they literally have children's books about this character called Petropeat uh, that is in the public schools. It's being taught as, you know, somehow kid appropriate material and it's propaganda. Uh, and um, if Johanna or Anthony, you want to address it in a more hopeful way. <laughs> I'm not sure. I can, well, I, I'll address it also in a hopeful way. But I think I just another piece that I think um, mixes the pot even more is the fact that many of our public school systems are also dependent on revenue from fossil fuel companies. So if you look to the Texas Permanent Fund, that's actually what is funding. Um, that is oil and gas royalties from Texas that then are actually um, how they fund their public schools and their universities and higher education there. So there's a lot of untangling that we need to do. Um, in order for us to make make the biggest amount of impact and start doing this. I think that there have been really important pieces of like climate education that have started to um, integrate into schools, but I think that it hasn't been taught from um, as much of a like social science perspective often too. And I think that that's something that we need to be better about integrating so that we can um, at a much earlier age understand the intersections of the like our colonial past um, and like, you know, I, the extraction that we've done on indigenous land and how that's connected to like how we have screwed people, um, indigenous people out of their land and out of their treaties. Um, and that's an ongoing piece. So I think that there's a huge amount of activism that needs to be Done. And you're actually seeing a lot of students take that up um, when it comes to telling the um, history of slavery in, in better ways and like black history. Um, and I think like we need to continue to um, ask like push school boards in a lot of ways for this as well as uh, increase our funding generally for our public schools. Like our teachers are not paid enough. They, like these are absolutely the places where we need to be investing. And it's some of the most disinvested parts of our community. And like, that is, you know, if we were able to take down the fossil fuel industry, if we're able to take down uh, the police, we actually could have increased money to go into these different pieces. And we need to do it now without those um, conditionalities. We have the ability to invest in um, our public schools and, and that will allow us hopefully to gain more access and provide the, ser the services that are necessary to integrate this into curricula. I guess my hopeful note would, I mean, you know, one word, decolonization. Um, we got another win today um, uh, with the Creek Nation uh, in their uh, Supreme Court case, McGritt v. Oklahoma. Turns out it is their land. <laughs> um, um, what a concept, um, um, which is incredible, but uh, that, that, that's, that, that's a process of, of, of decolonization that obviously needs to be scaled up, um, scaled out to um, Johanna's point. Um, and, and when we're talking about community control of, um, of how we make our food, how we make our power, also of our, of our curriculums. And that, and, and, and please don't um, confuse me with Betsy DeVos, that's not what I mean. <laughs> like, I mean, they should get funded um, um, for sure by, um, you know, in, in a fair way. And of course, we have to remove the idea that your zip code um, is going to de uh, determine how good your public education is, is going to be. So, um, but, 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 it, but it is hopeful. Um, I, I don't know what uh, Neil Gorsuch ate for breakfast this morning, but um, hopefully we can keep planting that um, and getting more decisions um, 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 like these because um, it's, it's, it's really, really important. Um, that that like you know we really shift. We, we have to take care of these communities. Um, I, again, just transition is, is not asking a, uh, a a a pipeline worker who's making a hundred grand to take a forty thousand dollar pay cut. Basab and Johanna hear me tell this joke all the time. If the average nonprofit worker took a forty thousand dollar pay cut, their salary would be negative twenty thousand. So um, you, you know we're 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 not we're not into that. That would be just a transition. And the same goes for communities. There are communities in Wyoming that are literally 100% um, uh, tied to the fracking. 
industry, their libraries, their schools, their roads. And um, if we take that industry out without having um, an alternative and ready to make them whole and, and a plan to just show them that we're going to do that, we can't expect um, workers um, to really embrace the ideas of just transition. This is why I am so um, thankful for incredible people like hopefully the next AFL-CIO president, uh, Sarah Nelson, um, who, um, <laughs> who Johanna also knows, like, I, I just, I, I can't get enough of, of Sister Nelson, who says that we have to keep the promises that we've made today to workers today. And this is why we're talking about things like the Reclaim Act, things like the Rewind Act. We have to show those workers and those communities right now that uh, Big Coal has had, had their way with them. Big Coal is dying, um, and they're just gonna leave extracted communities. We're gonna make those workers whole. We're gonna uh, train them. We're gonna um, honor their pensions. and once we do that for those workers, that's how you build a movement, right? That's how the, like, we get those workers on our side so they can talk to rank and file and, and, and keep building that out. One quick thing I would add to that is um, a part of decolonization is deprivatization. And sometimes privatization is obvious, sometimes it's creeping privatization. When you underfund your schools, you have effectively partially privatized them because you leave them dependent on private donors with agendas. So, you know, uh, you have this underfunded public school, typically in a community of color in a low income community. And um, you have the oil and gas industry and other predatory industries coming in saying, hey, you know, we're doing charity, we're helping these schools out. And they brag about it too, as part of their greenwashing. And they provide stuff like Petro Beat to, to these schools to try, try to indoctrinate kids who go to these schools to be their next generation of disposable workers exposed to safety risks exposed to pollutants, et cetera. That's their interest in the matter. So let me see if there's any other questions. Um, no more questions so far. Um, uh, just, you know, and ask to all the participants if you have, oh, okay. So someone asks, who has the primary obligation to educate their children? Uh, I would think the parents. Um, my response to that would be, yes, of course, parents educate their children, but we have schools for a reason. Uh, we have schools because obviously parents who are working do not have the time and the resources and the energy to uh, fully educate their children. That's why schools exist uh, pretty much in most parts of the world. Uh, so obviously, regardless of what parents are or aren't doing, we need effective, just school systems that provide education, good, solid education. The quality of the education matters uh, as a matter of right to all children uh, without, you know, without discrimination based on the inequalities we see in our society because uh, that just keeps perpetuating the inequalities generation after generation right. by not providing adequate education to uh, children from, um, you know, with less privilege. I would only add um, to that that uh, t uh, school choice, in my opinion, is a Trojan horse to privatization. Um, that that's just clear. Um, it's it's and many of these uh, so-called charter schools are funded by the fossil fuel industry, um, especially in places like Louisiana. Um, we talked about the shock doctrine earlier. Um, after Katrina, um, uh, the shock doctrine was utilized, the disaster capitalism to create all of these charter schools. Um, that's not increasing literacy rates. That's not increasing um, um, the, the quality of education. Of course, uh, Louisiana still ranks one of the lowest in, in, in public in education overall um, in, in the United States of America. So, um, you know, I, 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 and, and I, I reject the idea that it's like school choice because um, for many people, you don't have that choice um, if you're black or brown unless you can shoot, dunk, dribble, catch, and run fast. Um, so they're basically selecting 
who of, of, of our community are worthy of, of an education or, or a leg up. Um, and that's creating more division um, instead of collective uh, unified um, upliftment, which is what we're interested in. Um, um, the, uh, yes, um, I, I'm a father of a, of a five-year-old. Um, very, very sure that um, his mother and I are very, very invested in his education. His first book was A is for Activists in English and Spanish. <laughs> so, um, um, and whatnot, and he's gonna meet people like Johanna and people like Basav. Um, you know, he will have the choice of, of, of which one he wants to meet first. That, that'll be the, the, <laughs> the, the school choice that he has. But we have to be careful because when, when we uh, look at these charter schools, you know, who is actually funding them and why um, are, are they funding them? A, a robust public education that, it, that works for everybody um, scares the crap out of uh, out of governments that um, are into oligarchical um, systems of governance, um, and and yet we're seeing that in countries. And I'm not saying that there's an equivalency, but for some reason, a nation like Finland, which outlaws private schools, um, has a higher literacy rate, higher people getting into STEM, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, um, this idea that that we need private schools, I understand that in some cases people might want to send their children. I, I myself am Jewish. I have no problem with people who want, who want to send their children to uh, Jewish schools, um, uh, people of Islam who want to send their uh, children to um, Islamic schools, and then even cooperative schools. There's uh, Black liberation schools and cultural schools. I'm all for that. Um, and and I, what I'm not for, though, is uh, people's tax dollars uh, being used uh, for uh, public schools that can make their own rules and not subjected to the same rules as public schools. That's that's very much in line, again, this intersectional lens with how the fossil fuel industry uh, believes that they can operate um, without rules with our tax money through perverse subsidies, as Johanna uh, pointed out earlier, how big ag can operate without impunity, without following the same rules with our tax dollars. Um, it's, so it's, it's all um, 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 the same system. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what I would say to that. So there's another question about, you know, a follow-up question about schools, but I would like to point out that this is not primarily a webinar about schools and education, you know, uh, we don't have a planned webinar on that, we may at some point in the future. Uh, I just want to bring it back to uh, particularly um, fossil fuels and big ag and climate justice, because that's the main focus of what we are talking about today. And um, we have five more minutes, but I think we do have time for one more question. If, you know, uh, anyone has a question about those subjects. And hearing none, um, I'd love to hear some closing thoughts from both of you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for putting this together. I, I just want to like recognize how wonderful of an experience it is working with these two amazing allies. Like the fact that we get to really like bring to the forefront that like this it has to be an intersectional movement and like that we can think super differently like we don't have to stick with hegemony um and we have more tools in our toolbox than i think we sometimes realize and like that's what i love about working with um these folks on the phone basav and anthony like they're so down to think um, in these new like systemic ways that like get to the root of like the multiple crises that are hitting us right now and coming up with the, the solutions that will serve our communities. And so um, just, I love um, the opportunity to create visions with you all and um, excited for us to take down the fossil fuel industry and just generally the, our oppressors. <laughs> That's right. Um, thank you, Johanna. Um, I would say my uh, closing remarks would uh, just really be as we're in this election season to uh, remind all the folks who are attending to please pay attention to um, local and state level um, elections. Um, we can move so much incredible stuff there. Um, the New York Renews um, Act being a perfect example of that. We're seeing, um, you know, uh, Green New Deal resolutions being passed in cities like Seattle. 
um, public banking being passed in, in, in California, 8857. Um, so we, we and, um, and, and then most recently in Seattle, um, the $200 million Amazon tax or, 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 or tax on big businesses, Portland, the 1% tax on, on big businesses, which would be reinvested into just transition um, um, projects. So um, you can make a lot of change there in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, five progressive women ran as a slate to basically overtake um, problematic Democrats. Four out of five of them won, which I would say is a takeover. The one sister who lost only lost by two or three points. So um, there's a lot of power um, in local. Um, and when we forget about that, that is how we get state governments taken over by um, just, just really draconian people, which leads to bathroom uh, 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 anti-trans uh, bills, which leads to um, anti-women's uh, 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 choice bills, and, and even uh, bills uh, uh, that allow a state to tell a local community, no, you can't ban fracking. So uh, there's a lot of power um, in local, um, and, and I, I would just beseech people to please um, keep uh, very vigilant about that and to take part in that process as well. My last closing comment would be, you know, Anthony mentioned how uh, he's the parent of a five-year-old and I likewise am the parent of a 12-year-old and she's about to turn 13. Ah. <laughs> but, you know, children have imagination, right? That's, that's one of the characteristics of kids is they, that they have a fertile imagination and we encourage them to have that then why is it that we grown-ups often lack imagination? I would argue that one of the most powerful tools at our disposal as humans is our imagination. And by imagining big things, we can start building the seeds of revolutionary political movements. Uh, you know, if we limit our imagination to what elites tell us we can or cannot do, we are bound to fail. And it's only by imagining big transformative revolutionary changes that we can start working for them and winning them. And um, uh, thank you again to everyone who joined this webinar and huge thank you to uh, Anthony and Johanna for uh, being co-presenters with me and to Netfa and Justin and the rest of the team at IPS for making this possible. And bye everyone, thank you. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thanks to the full IPS staff for putting this on. It's been wonderful. Bye everyone. See you. Bye.